<laughs> well, I would like to welcome everyone to the College of Arts and Science and UNK Warner Lecture. Um, hosted by just a, just a brief bio on the Warner Lecture itself. Um, this was launched in 2017 to address important issues in Nebraska and recognize the service of Charles Warner and his son Jerome Warner, two prominent former state senators who played a significant role in UNK's history. Funding for the event is provided by the Chancellor's Office as well as the College of Arts and Science. And uh, we are very privileged to have with us uh, two of the staple leaders of our system. Um, and I am going to introduce just one of those, and that would be someone with whom you're probably pretty familiar. Um, Chancellor Christensen was appointed to lead the University of Nebraska Kearney in July 2002, following a distinguished career in the Nebraska legislature. He represented the 37th legislative district, and at the time he retired from office, was the longest serving speaker of the legislature. During his tenure as Nebraska State Senator, Chancellor Christensen was instrumental in passing significant legislation and numerous constitutional amendments. He sponsored legislation that created Nebraska Court of Appeals and the Tax Equalization and Review Commission, and was also one of the sponsors of legislation that brought then Kearney State College into the University of Nebraska system. Um, by the way, my name is Dr. Ryan Teton, and I am the Dean of the College of Arts and Science, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here for this event, as well as to introduce one of our special guests, and that is Chancellor Doug Christensen. Thank you very much. Dean Teton, thank you very much. I'm not sure it's quite appropriate to introduce the introducer, but uh, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, the Warner Lectures are modeled after the uh, legendary state senator, Jerome Warner, and his father, Charles, as Teton's. Jerry, who spent most of his life dedicated to policy and process for this state, really got his training from his family from their kitchen table. Because as a young man, he would sit at the kitchen table. His father was lieutenant governor, the first uh, speaker of the unicameral, and he would listen. They didn't have, obviously, social media. I'm not even sure they had a phone out on the farm. But everybody would come out to the Warner table and talk about the issues of the day talk about the important issues around Nebraska. Jerry often told me he uh, learned the most from listening to people who opposed him. Now, these lectures aren't designed uh, to have opposition. They're designed, I think, to talk about the important issues affecting Nebraska every day. And today is clearly one of those days. And it's my pleasure uh, to introduce today's Warner Lecturer, and that's President Ted Carter. He is the university's eighth president, serving most recently prior to that at his alma mater, the United States Naval Academy from 2014 to 2019. He was the longest continuously serving superintendent in Annapolis, uh, obviously done by special request of the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations. Uh, while he was at the academy, which is essentially a university, uh, they were ranked number one in the country. It's a public university by four points. Along with all the cadets at Annapolis, he was responsible for Bancroft Hall. I notice you still smile when I say Bancroft Hall. Do you realize that Bancroft Hall is the largest residence hall in the world? It has 4,000 midshipmen, 1,700 rooms, almost five miles of quarters, and three, 33 acres of floor space in one residence. We think we have trouble with Centennial Towers East. Um, obviously, Bancroft Hall had uh, barber shops, banks, uh, cobblers, gyms, medical clinics, etc. But they were all part of his experience of higher education. Uh, he also served as president of the United States Naval War College. He has extensive and impressive military service, of which we're deeply indebted to him. And I find it really difficult to give his service really its due honor and credit and brief introduction. But obviously, uh, on a personal note, I can't imagine a better person to lead the University of Nebraska system. He's come in at a very difficult 
time, under many stresses and strains that face all university systems, but particularly during a pandemic. Uh, the chancellors and I have, uh, the other campuses have talked extensively. We admire his leadership. We are thrilled that he chosen to become part of the University of Nebraska system. It's also my pleasure to introduce and recognize his wife, Linda Carter. Linda, would you please wave? Thanks for being here today. Yeah. They are no strangers to Kearney. They're here a lot. They've become great friends of the campus. And here's the bottom line. Here's what you got to know. President Carter and Linda have had Jimmy Buffett at their home, and they've just returned from trying to watch the launch of NASA's SpaceX crew number three, which has been delayed. And so he has a very special relationship to that mission, speciali mission specialist, Kayla Barone, Barron, and she was under his command. So both Jimmy and Kayla have outstanding credentials in their fields, and here's my hope that both of them can come to Nebraska. All fun aside, it's my honor to welcome and introduce to you the president of the University of Nebraska System, President Ted Carr. Wow. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Doug, thank you for an uh, incredibly generous introduction. Uh, I probably could get up here and talk about Bancroft Hall for the entire hour. So thanks for reminding me of that. And uh, thanks for recognizing Linda. Uh, we do love coming out here. and We've been out here from the beginning of our time and our relationship with the state of Nebraska. And to be invited here today to uh, be part of this important lecture series, the Warner Lecture Series. Now, I, I've had a chance to speak in a lot of different venues, in a lot of different places, on a lot of different topics. This is a topic I care passionately about. And to be part of the Warner family by name in this lecture series is really a distinct honor. And I know, as Doug just gave a great warm up to who the Warners were Charles Warner, amazing politician, graduate of the University of Nebraska before the turn of the century, 1899, actually was part of this university becoming Kearney State Teachers College about that era when we were bringing women to what was then known as the normal school here in 1905. You know, and then his son, Jerry, 36 years as a senator, following his dad's footsteps, was here for that period of time on July 1st, 1991, when the university was created here at Kearney. I mean, two legends that have over 60 years of service we didn't have term limits for senators. I think Charles served as lieutenant governor for four I did. It's an amazing legacy. And this lecture series is created not because you want somebody to come in here and tell you something. It's really intended to have a dialogue. In fact, uh, opposing views were something that they were famous for. So I'm going to talk here for a few minutes. We're going to have some chance for uh, questions and answers. I'm going to back and sit down and we're going to have a chance to have maybe a little bit of a dialogue. And the topic that we want to talk about today is something that's near and dear to this university, to the entire state of Nebraska, quite honestly our nation, at this really critical time. The future of higher education. What does education need to be? What will it be in the 21st century? Now, before you go into any topic, you really have to be able to do three things. You've got to be able to look backwards look a little bit into the present, kind of define where you are, make sure you understand what the problem is, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we think the solutions are for going. Now we think about how young we are as a fledgling nation. Think about the wars in 1776. You know, higher education in this nation started well before that. We're talking about not long after the Pilgrims the Harvard University, 1636, kind of our gold bearer for higher education. That's really when education started in our nation. But think about who went to Harvard from 1636 for almost 200 years. White men, 
men of privilege, mostly ministers and religious background. It took almost 200 years with the creation of some other higher education institutions to be created before we would go to really that next level of education. College and university was for the elitists. But one of the biggest changes in all of higher ed happened when President Abraham Lincoln, 1862, signed the Morella. It really changed education, probably more than almost anything else I could describe over the course of the now 385 years history in education. It created this idea of a land grant university where education could be available to farmers and ranchers, sons and daughters, people without means. Then you think about our nation going through the Civil War, creation of historically black colleges and universities. That was a change. A whole different population of people really had no access to higher education. Now in some small pockets, very regionalized, go to school. And then the founding of our own university, two years after we established ourselves as a state, February 15, 1869, we became a university. What would follow for our system would be a metropolitan campus in Omaha, a medical center, world class, and this campus here at the University of Minnesota, not far after. It's an amazing story just in the state of Nebraska, and in some ways, a microcosm of the entire path of the university and college system for our nation. There would be other landmark achievements that would change the trajectory of higher education. Go through Civil War, or excuse me, World War I, not much change. World War II, the advent of the GI Bill, post World War II GI Bill in 1944. In 1944, there were 1.5 million men and some women that were in college. By 1947, after the GI Bill was enacted and the war was over, another one million veterans of the war went to college. Almost doubled all of the education population just because we gave those who served free tuition and fees that would support them to go to campus. It was an incredible game changer. Sputnik. 1957, what would that have to do with education? Well, besides creating what we now know as the space race, it also required universities to get money from state, federal government to do research. In fact, from 1954 to 1958, research across all of our universities in the country moved 50% because of Sputnik. I'm going to drop an anchor on that. We'll call that Sputnik 1.0 for now. Now, there were other things that happened. 1960s, the Civil Rights Movement, and Affirmative Action. 1965, the Higher Education Act. President Lyndon Johnson realized that our nation would never move forward unless something was done at the federal level to change access to higher education. Now, the Higher Education Act of 1965 probably doesn't ring a bell with too many people because about 15 years later, Senator Claiborne Pell, Democrat from the great state of Rhode Island, my home state, would have the Pell Grant system named after him. That was the Higher Education Act, making education affordable, financial aid, low, low interest rate student loans. And a fun fact for me personally, Senator Claiborne Pell was my nominating senator to go to the U.S. Naval Academy in 1977. I stayed in touch with him almost till the end of the day. Usually ran into him at the airport, fly home for years. There were other changes to higher education. You know, it wasn't that long ago that some of these things called diploma mills or for profit education systems came online. Most of them associated with online education. Phoenix University at one time had almost one million students. In fact, if you go back to 
the changes between what happened with all of those moments in time. There were significant impacts that came from just that history, and we'll get to the history of the now with COVID and what that meant. But when you look at the impact of what happened about changing in affordability and access, one of those big changes is the population of Americans that actually went to college. So at the time of the founding of the University of Nebraska, there were about 50,000 students nationwide that were going to universities across the country. By the time we got to the post-9-11 GI Bill, we're talking about 20 million Americans. And if you go back to that original date, only about 2% of those that were in that age group, 18 to 24, today it's about 40%. And the percent of women that were in college back in those days was minuscule. And starting in 1970, something happened women started applying to go to school. They not only achieved their equal status as a 50-50 population on college campuses, but by 1990, they started to surpass the number of men on college campuses. It's an amazing story and not one that's told very often. You're starting to read about it now in Chronicle of Higher Ed and some other publications. Today, nationwide, women comprise 60% of undergraduate and graduate programs compared to 40% of them. And yet, in high-tech fields, in most job markets, men still prevail in the job market. We can get after why those exist. There are lots of things that we should be looking at in terms of what that impacts. And then what are the problems that exist today? But we can get into this approach up to what's happened in COVID. I'm going to save that as we go into what's going to be going. Some of the challenges that exist today is actually the, the very dialogue centered around what's the value proposition of an undergraduate or a graduate. Ten years ago, 70% of Americans believed that an undergraduate degree was the right thing to do, great support. Today it's about 50. percent of jobs that we need today in a high-tech, high-speed world where there's a whole lot of automation, whether it be supply chain, movement of goods, things that we used to have a lot of people have to do, about 60% of all the high-paying jobs in the country and actually in the world now require some sort of post-secondary degree, and that's going higher. The other challenges we have is today's youth have a whole different view of what work looks like. Part of the problem of not getting men to campus is they know they can get a job, they can find other ways to get education, certificates, be paid well, maybe not see them into that. You know, during this period of time when so many Americans believed an undergraduate degree was important, it was well known that it was the ticket to the upper middle class undergraduate degree earn you $1 million more in lifetime earnings than if you didn't have an undergraduate degree. And yet here we are now, we're having to talk about whether or not there's a value proposition to get a degree. And as much as we've seen changes with historically black colleges and universities, affordability and accessibility, as we now approach this period of time that we've been in over the last two years, We've been presented other challenges. Now, I'm going to tell you that these changes and the challenges going forward were already in the works. Most state universities, public or private, are starting to cost themselves out. Higher education is never known to be dynamic. We've always had this idea that if we just stay the course, we're a Harvard or a Princeton, Michigan or a Michigan State, or a Purdue, they're going to come because they need us. These are some real challenges. When I entered the workforce in 1981, it didn't matter whether it was in the military, the average person going into a profession would stay with one company for the majority of their working life, maybe two, three at the most. The current generation 
students that are in college will go through 12 different jobs in their life. We got to understand that. We got to know that. That's that's a challenge. And COVID, COVID may be the reason that we will accelerate change to the higher education system, but it's already had some immediate impact. Again, nationwide statistics. This year, student enrollment dropped 3% nationwide. The year before, 5%. That's a pretty big drop. Now, we didn't feel that as much here in Nebraska, and my intent was not to talk about how we have navigated this. I'm going to stay above that, but we can do some of that if you want question and answer. But we do have some big challenges out in front of us. And because of those drops and those changes, and significant change in what's happening in the demographics of our country, the underrepresented, not just here in the state of Nebraska, but nationwide, they're actually being left behind. I just gave you those statistics for you know, percentage of uh, student enrollment drop. For underrepresented minorities, it was double digit nationwide in the course of those two years. And underrepresented doesn't just mean the color of your skin. You know, if you come from a rural part of Nebraska, you could easily be underrepresented. Male versus women. I talked about the percentage on a college campus. How do we make sure that women see access to STEM based fields, cybersecurity, medicine field, and not just nursing? There's no job out there that any woman can't do, and they're filling our ranks at the college campuses, but yet the workforce doesn't reflect that, and it certainly doesn't reflect it in equal. And then how do we connect university with the job? Because they're both changing, and they're changing in different directions. So these are just some of the problems that we have out in front of us, as we are now navigating ourselves through COVID-19, we have figured out to some degree, some places successful, some not so successful, about how to do remote education. Modality is a thing, and we'll talk a little bit about it. Then how do we tell the story? Who's responsible for making sure that somebody's telling the story about what the value proposition of university is? This gets to what I would probably say is one of the biggest challenges that we have out in front of us, and it's bigger than even higher education. This is trust in leaders who are in charge of large enterprises. And this is a sign of our times. This is a sign of being cooped up for too long. People wanting to show their rage. People wanting to show how divisive we are. There's distrust in our political leaders. There's distrust in our medical leaders. There's distrust in our military. And there's certainly distrust in somebody like me or Chancellor Doug Christensen who are telling you what we should be doing, what we look like, and why you should go to college or university. Because that's kind of where we are right now. we got to get through that. And each and every one of us, I would say, for the purpose of this discussion, has some level of responsibility to be able to tell that story. And for my nearly two years of being in this great state of Nebraska, we tend to not be that good at telling our good story. And we do have a good story. But we've got some work to do there. So that's a little bit about where we've been, a little bit of the evolution of education and higher ed uh, here in our state and our country. Some of the immediate challenges, I didn't touch on all of them. There are more. What do we have to do and what's it going to take to be successful going into the future? And how long do we have to make some of these pivots? You know, as I kind of defined the now, we talked a little bit about how we pivoted here in Nebraska. We did not see nearly that enrollment drop. We know that our student body demographics are changing. They're changing pretty dramatically. Are we ready for that? Do we know how to handle that? Are we ready to change our faculty and staff with that as well to show that type of success? And then how do we connect those students to the future? So I'm going to give you three concepts about what I think have to change in the 21st century. And there will be some universities that will not get this. And some of them are big names. They're just too big to fail. They're not going to change. We're going we're to stay as we were because that's our brand. 
And some of those smaller public and private universities, if they don't follow this formula, they're going to go away. And you're starting to see that. There are some predictions that we will lose 5 to 10 percent of our universities in this nation over the next, next 10 years. Not just because of COVID, but because of all the other things that are now coming on the backside. So number one, the first thing that we're going to have to be able to do, and it comes right back to us here on this front stage, we've got to be accountable. System leadership, campus leadership, we got to own the problem. We better know our own data. We got to share it publicly. We got to analyze it. We got to create a set of metrics to show why we do what we do. It's a pretty simple com concept. For decades, I would argue for probably 300 of the 385 years, higher ed. Students have always been a product. That doesn't work anymore. We don't exist without students. Universities will fail because enrollment will get so bad, or they will go so disproportionate between the balance between men and women that they won't be able to attract men anymore because some universities will be pegged as a women's only university. That's a real problem in some areas in this country, not here in Nebraska. But we have to be accountable. And that means if we're going to measure something, we've got to be able to share it publicly, and we've got to be able to change our behavior, drive the metrics in the right direction. We're talking about retention, graduation, who gets to come in, how we take care of our faculty and staff, and making sure students feel like they got an a la carte type menu to get the education they want. In person, online, hybrid, whatever it is. Cross-functional cross-discipline, immersive, hands-on, using all the technology tools that are out there. We have a responsibility to do that. We also have a responsibility to ask for only the money that we need. We can't go to the legislature and say, I need 5% budget increase just because I gotta hold on to every program I've ever had. You've seen us change some of that behavior already. You've seen us enact a $42.5 million budget. And even when the revenue looked like it was going to be better than we anticipated and the enrollment was better than anticipated, we realized we had to stick to that. Otherwise, we were strategically going in the wrong direction. And we, all of us, have to have a relationship with Unicameral so that they can look every Nebraska taxpayer in the eye and say, the university is doing the right thing with these precious resources. That's what I talk about when we talk about it. And if we can't do that, and for the campuses that can't do that, it's just go as you always have, you do so at great peril. The next thing we have to be able to do is close this gap, this gap between accessibility and achievement. You know, it's always amazing to me, and I, I have to admit I was relatively new on the, the whole college scene when I entered U.S. Naval Academy superintendent. It's the same thing as being a college president. It's a relatively small school, you know, very high-performing students there, about 4,400 midshipmen. There's no way to leave there unless you are there for four years. It's a four-year program. But yet, here in our nation, we measure graduation rate by six years. Why? Why do we lower that bar? to say that's where we measure success. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't work for some. There are some students that need to be at work. We have adult learners. There's a lot of reasons that people will stay in a class more than four years. Let's face it. You can do the simple math. It costs more to be in a college setting the longer you're there. You're going to pay more or have to need more aid and tuition, get housing costs, food costs, parking, all those things. We have a responsibility to make sure that our students, and now we have this four-year graduation, but universities that don't get that, and again, this goes back to this concept about accountability, but this is achievement for students. They don't come to campus just to get a couple of courses. They come to get a degree. Accessibility, we're still too expensive. Now, we froze tuition here the last two years. I would argue that UNK, UNO, 
UNL compared to any of their peers. Summit League, Big Ten, out here in the Midwest, MIAA and other schools that are in that uh, category here with Kearney. We are the best value of all of them. And we should be proud of that. And yet still, school is still unattainable for a lot of people because of the cost. It's one of the reasons we created Nebraska Promise. Free tuition for those earning $60,000 or less. Got a lot of copycats of that nationwide. And now that the Biden administration is not going to get free community college, they're probably going to move the needle on the Pell Grant, about $500 per student, which will take them up to a max of around $6,300 to close to $7,000. That won't be enough. And about 70% of our students are getting some sort of aid today. And why is that? Because the demographics are changing. The state of Nebraska will have 40% of their students graduate from high school, students of color, by the year 20. Think about that. That's almost double the percent of students graduating out of high school where we are. And yet, in our university system, we're over 20% students of color higher than the state average. So we're changing to that demographic at the student body level. We're not at the faculty and staff level. And again, why does that matter? Are we doing this just because it's affirmative action or we need, think we need to just make sure that we are, are doing it to do it? No, it's because we can't be successful without making everybody have affordable access to higher education. We need all of we need everybody to be able to join our work. We'll be better together. The last piece that I will share with you is really probably the most important. Innovation, innovation, innovation. You know, during my time at the Naval Academy, I learned that Nobody just sits in a classroom and passively gets fed information off a blackboard or a whiteboard and expects to learn by regurgitating. That's not what education has become anywhere anymore. I've also been a big believer that the only way we'll really attract students is only do it in person. I'm proud of the fact that we had in-person education as hard as it was in the fall of 20. Full up, open as much as we can be with masks, with the choice to be vaccinated, all those tough decisions here in 2021. But here's the facts. And the pandemic exposed this a little bit, and it was already growing. The number of students that are taking online courses is changing. Some of it is uh, those for-profit colleges that showed us that, that ability. Some of it was just the needs of the workforce. 33 million Americans have some partial college work in their, in their portfolio, but yet they're in the workforce. They aren't necessarily ready to go to night school, but they can take an online course at UNO or UNK from anywhere in the country. Ten years ago, about 20% of students were taking some version of online, whether they were assigned on campus or were doing online education completely for their entire curriculum. Today, it's 50%. And that's at a time when we have everything available in person. And I would submit to you that in the next five years, it'll be 100%. Why? Because it fits their a la carte menu concept. It might be a course that's hard to get. It might fit their uh, time to maybe take an extra course during winter break. There's a host of reasons. But we better be prepared and we're going to have to deliver on that. You know, one thing that we've learned this semester for the classrooms, and we're probably about 40% system-wide, where we have cameras set up for live education, but we're recording. And the students know where those classrooms are, and they've told us, hey, we want to see that, that lecture, that, that classroom experience hung somewhere so I can go back and watch it over again. Yeah, I've got notes, I've got textbooks. But this is a whole new hybrid version of learning. Not worried about you know, how it's digitized or how much space it takes up. We're able to now navigate. 
So that's one way to innovate. We have to be able to innovate in who we're subscribing to. I mentioned this adult workforce that's out there. It's here in Nebraska, too. Many of them work for the Fortune 500 companies in the state. Do we have a responsibility? Should we be innovating our curriculum to go after that workforce so that they can either get certificates, stack credentials, or whatever extra education they want to have that's in concert with their employer who wants them to have it and that we can offer to them, probably mostly remote. There's a demand signal. We might be missing some. And the final piece that I'll offer up is a, a surprising statistic to me. When you look at the entire population of college-age students that are out there today, one in three of them will transfer to another university, a college, or from a community college. One in three. Are we prepared, even within our own state, to make sure that there are no loss of credentials or credits? Does somebody have to take some courseware over just because somewhere, even in our own system, they don't accept that gen ed course? There's a real opportunity for us to close that gap and innovate that so that we are now making sure, giving everybody that opportunity to finish in a, you know, a very short timeline with a minimal amount of debt, and then eventually, as we will see us do this year, and as other campuses are starting to get better at, how do we connect our students to the future work? How do we make sure that they are ready for the work? How are we making sure that we are working in concert with our K-12 partners who have not had it's probably a successful year in remote education as we at the University of Nebraska and other major universities have? I would argue with you that for fifth grade, sixth grade, maybe even seventh, eighth graders, they might have had an entire lost year. And we're going to have to be ready to take that on. One last point before I go to questions, and that is the issue of health. We have a responsibility, and this is also part of the innovation that we're going to have to learn how to do. Mental health especially. I personally watch mental health needs of students from an institution like the Naval Academy and certainly here at the University of Nebraska quadruple. Just, just over the last seven or eight years. And the pandemic has made it even harder. And this isn't about kowtowing to somebody that should just be told, hey, toughen up, get over it. This is, this is real. And the sooner we get to it and destigmatize it and work on it, make that available to our students, as well as our faculty and staff, the better chance we have of having a healthier campus and lifestyle. So I'll close with the universities that have this type of free thinking, ones that will listen, ones that will listen to faculty, faculty senate, staff, understand the student as a customer, ones that can innovate, ones that can hold themselves accountable, and the ones that can make sure that they are being accessible and make our students get to that achievement, they're the ones that are going to be successful 20%. That will be our Sputnik 2.0. That's what's going to change us. I'm excited about our future here at the University of Nebraska. I can tell you that our campus leaders, our researchers, our faculty, I've heard these ideas. They do think this. And they get that we have a need to fill the workforce of the state of Nebraska. And we have a need to not only grow our enrollment, we're going to grow our state. The university system is going to be the way. So I thank you for your time today. I thank you for your attention. I really thank you for your support. Each and every one of you are ambassadors for our university system. Each and every one of you, as I said early on, some of these challenges now are empowered to be able to tell our story to whatever circle of influence you have. That, I'm going to take a seat. I'm going to take your questions. Thank you all very much. Uh, pleasure with President Carter is uh, we've all gotten used to more and more naval terms than we've ever thought of in the past so uh, when you hear drop anchor on something yeah we've all had to pick up on that uh, 
number of questions we've gotten from students in here, and I, one of them I think that is, is interesting is, in your view, uh, what role do the humanities, specifically reading, writing, narratives, poetry, play in higher education, and, and in particular, the NU system? So this is, a, this is a really great question about what role do the humanities play in the future of higher education? And we, let's add to that, to the future of the workforce. Uh, I think it's a pretty simple answer. We can't ever grow or move into whatever job we're going, especially the tech, without the humanities. Uh, humanities what's, what give us the basics to know how to communicate, how to write, how to express ideas, how to be critical thinkers. So it isn't just about what physics course you take or which calculus or, you know, what thermodynamics courses you take, especially if you were in an engineering field or technical field. I'm a big believer that you have to be well-rounded with the humanities. Uh, and that's, I was fortunate. I was exposed to that. Um, I went to a very good high school. My mother was an English teacher. She beat me up pretty hard to help try to get me to learn how to write. So I had that uh, in me when I went to the Naval Academy, and the Naval Academy was a strong liberal arts program. I'm thankful for that. Uh, they forced us to have to get up and be able to deliver ideas and messaging and speak. I worry that a lot of our technical fields, especially things that are really technical, like artificial intelligence, data science, data management, cybersecurity, engineering in general, uh, throughout all of those fields, and even the medical sciences, sometimes don't put enough emphasis on the liberal arts because uh, it, it's really critically important. And of course, this school has a great history of great liberal arts here. So uh, I, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here when we're talking about the importance of liberal arts. So on that same track, what do you think uh, some of the most important career areas are that higher education should be playing a future role in? So. What careers do you think we ought to be looking at? Yeah, I think I just started to go through a little bit of that laundry list, but uh, I'm going to try to narrowly focus here on the state of Nebraska. And as I said earlier in my talk, there is something about, you know, the microcosm of which Nebraska is that's representative of the whole nation. Now, let's face it. First of all, we're an ag state. You know, 92% of our land mass is agriculture and ranching. But that doesn't mean that we don't have the future workforce that's not only going to be able to take care of the land and know how to take care of feeding 10 billion people by the year 2050. We're going to have to get pretty good at that. We're going to have to do more with less water. We're going to have to know how to navigate ourselves through droughts and floods. And we're going to do so with less farmers and less ranchers. So I think that is a trend that we can count on. But yet, as I mentioned earlier, 70% of the job market by 2050 it's going to require some post-secondary education. And I'm not just talking about vocational skills, plumbing and electricians and people that can manage air conditioning. Yeah, that, that's, that's going to be a requirement still. But the STEM-based fields, are going to, they're going to take over. We're going to find a workforce in the future that's going to be able to work more remotely. Now, the supply chain management field is going to change. I think higher ed is going to have to respond to that and know how to manage that. Uh, medicine is changing also. Uh, doctors, nurses, pharmacists occupational specialists, uh, all those fields, we have a great need. We have 93 counties in the state. Uh, about a third of them don't have the right level of medical care in them, especially the further west we go. We got, we got to fix that. Uh, and then the last part I'll mention is, uh, is the, what we operate on every day. I mean, we have more computing power in the hand of our cell phone than any piece of technology, and certainly any fighter jet I ever flew in, ever today, going back to you know my time flying off the USS Midway and F-4 Phantoms, F-14 Tomcats, even the F-18 Super Hornet, all of our cell phones today have more computing power in that than any of those high-performance jet aircraft. I, I mention that because when I mentioned that Sputnik 2.0, I wasn't just talking about higher ed, I'm talking about techno technological changes. We are about to leap into a new world. When the world goes to 5G and then 6G, it's going to be a game changer for everything. We're going to need a workforce that understands that and work. The STEM-based fields are going to be born from higher education. Now, that's not to say that we all have to just become engineering and STEM-based fields. 
we're going to need other educational fields as well. But that's where the jobs are going to be. And the universities that can turn to that and open that up a little bit are going to do well. And there'll be other needs too. Uh, but we may not be able to be everything to everybody. We may not be able to carry 550 different academic disciplines. We may, over the next 10 to 20 years, have to let some disciplines go and expand others. You know, we really don't have a whole lot that is being taught in undergraduate campuses anywhere in the nation on what the future of cyber operations. Notice I didn't say um, cyber defense or cyber security. A lot of people think when we're talking about the internet, that's the only thing that we have to do. Cyber operations is so much more complex. And it does. It touches everything, data management, data science, artificial intelligence, remote things that operate. We're going to see much, much more of that robotics, things that fly and operate remotely. We've got to have the academic programs that set us up to be ready for that workforce. So we are going to evolve. And the universities that are dynamic and can pivot and create academic curricula, not only will draw those students, they're the ones that will make them ready for that future workforce. This student wanted to know what's the uh one thing you wish the public knew about your job that they probably uh, oh boy outside of how what a pleasure it is to work with UNK yeah uh, there are there are many parts of the job that are just so eye-opening that are good that I think sometimes the, the quick first shot answer would be you know something that's not so good. Uh, I'll just tell you the first, the biggest good thing. Uh, the university is cared about and uh, is revered across the state. I think as much as any state I've ever been. In. I'm not saying that because I'm your university president. I feel that. I see that. Lynn and I have had a chance to travel the state. We need to get back out further west more. Uh, we, this Carney can't be the furthest west we ever go. We've got to keep going further west and touch the rest of the state more. We have done some of that. But the state really does care about the university. And it isn't just athletics. It is the entire university. So that's, I'd say that's the first thing that I think, I wish people, everybody knew that. The second is um, the challenge of navigating uh, in a political world. I've been apolitical for 38 years, wearing the cloth of the nation. I was afforded that. I respected that. Uh, I'm one of those people that never wanted to go on a talk show or be on a news show and talk about national security uh, because I was involved in that. It's one of the reasons I was so excited to be offered this opportunity to continue and stay in higher education. But yet, because of who we are and what we do, we are often kind of wrapped into things that might be considered political. I do everything I to continue to stay apolitical. And it's difficult. I think everybody can understand how difficult that can be. We've, we play that out in front of some of our Board of Regents. They're public. They're available. They're, they're viewed. Sometimes they're viewed by a lot more people out of the state than they are viewed by people in the state because we're dealing with really weighty issues, and they touch politics. So I try and I remind myself all the time, whether I'm talking to a Board of Regents, the governor, our state senators, of which I have a relationship with all of them, which somebody would say, well, that means your job is political. And maybe it kind of is. And Doug has guided me through a lot of those tough wickets uh, since I've been here because he is a master at it, and you should know that. Uh, but I try to stay above that fray. I really, really do. And I think the only way we'll be successful as a university is to make sure that we are free and fair, welcoming to all, and not blue. Even in a state which leans one side of the aisle more, way more than the other, it doesn't matter. We have to be fair for everyone. Okay. Got one last question. We have time. That is, where do you see the university in the next in relationship? So the, where the relationship of the university is and what we're doing uh, in terms of being in the pandemic, that the first thing I would just tell everybody in this audience is uh, how proud I am of the leadership on every campus. Uh, 
one of the things that we try to do is have some level of consistency across all argue five campuses because I'm going to include Curtis which is not co-located co with anybody but I've also made sure that the chancellors had enough freedom of maneuver that's a military term for you right there I, I picked up on those now pretty good um, but freedom of uh, leadership and decision making for what's best for their unit campus you know the the climate and what's happening with COVID-19 here in Kearney is going to be different than what's happening in a very populated metropolitan campus in Omaha. It's even different than what's happening in Lincoln. So I have never told one chancellor that you should be wearing masks because the other campuses, or that you should be driving towards this level of vaccination rate because this other campus has got that. And yet, because we have such strong leadership and we have such good input from all those who care on both sides of every question that comes up, we have done exceptionally well. Now, we're not across the finish line yet, and we shouldn't be patting ourselves in the back just yet. Although I will point out, even though we've had COVID cases on every campus, we've had faculty, we've had staff, and we've got a very decent level, high level of vaccination rate, which I'm very proud of. We're not done, and we can't let our guard down. So you should know before we came out here, Doug and I just did kind of a, a PSA on vaccination. You have to still probably tell people they should go be educated on vaccinations. And if they're on the fence, go ahead and get it. Not because I said it or Doug said it, but because they should be educated and know what the risks are. We're still losing people. Four people died in Kearney this weekend from COVID-19. I don't know any of the details. I just know four people died. That's more than died in Lincoln. You know, sometimes the more rural parts of our state lag in these infection rates. And we've seen that. When there have been spikes on the eastern side of Nebraska, the middle and the western part of the state aren't there yet, but then they follow. I'm a little bit worried that we're not done and there's some of those spikes still hanging around. And the way we get out of that is to make sure people understand are educated, and can make their right personal decision, vaccination. Now, I will say this one more, one more thing. I do believe, and this is Ted Carter's opinion only, Jeff Gold has not told me this, and I don't even know if Jeff agrees with this, that we're gonna see an infection rate of COVID-19 drop precipitously sometime in the spring. I think we're gonna have a little up and down here in the winter. I think if we keep these other crazy variants that Delta plus the mu variant, I know there's others. We keep them out of our country and we keep them away. We keep the vaccination rate up above that 70 to 80% level. We will find ourselves out of this. I think we're still gonna have some level of it for years. I don't think we'll stop saying COVID-19 for probably five to 10 years, but it'll be down at a level that we'll be worried about it much less than we have to still worry about. Thank you very much. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, would you, would you please show your appreciation for President Carter? <laughs> Dean Teen, I believe we uh, turn it over to you at the moment. Uh, for better or for worse, absolutely. <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank everyone who uh, made this possible. Uh, secondly, uh, I would like to thank you for, for coming and sharing your positions with us and, and engaging this very, very important issue. And uh, as a gift, we have uh, kind of both of the arts and science represented here. So we have a plant that was grown in our greenhouse as well as a hand-blown pot from uh, the art department for you, sir. So. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And for, uh, for Linda, um, this is a hand-blown glass vase for you from our art department because you came in last time and had seen them blowing glass and they wanted to make sure that, that you knew that you had something as well. So uh, thank you so much for being a part of our event today. And thank you everybody for coming. This is a seminal event and we really appreciate all the attendance. So thank you very much and have a wonderful day.